Welcome to a brand new episode of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest. Uh, we have Daniel Bergner. He's a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine and author of five previous books of award-winning nonfiction, the New York Times bestselling Sink for Your Life, What Do Women Want, The Other Side of Desire, In the Land of Magic Soldiers, and The God of the Rodeo. His writings have also appeared in The Atlantic, Granta, Harper's Magazine, Mother Jones, Talk, and the New York Times Book Review. And his newest book, coming out on May 17th, is called The Mind and the Moon, My Brother's Story, The Science of Our Brains, and The Search for Our Psyches. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you. Absolutely, man. So I want to start with a passage before we begin our conversation. So Daniel writes, were it not for my brother, I would have measured against, I would have never, oh wow, were it not for my brother, I would never have measured that chasm against the distance between here and the moon. Were it not for my brother, I would never have spent time with a neuroscientist and former director of the National Institute of Mental Health, the largest mental health research organization in the world, who viewed the brain through the lens of a short story by the Argentinian postmodernist, Jorge Luis Borges, the guard and of working paths, a tale of labyrinths and immeasurable bifurcations and through the ancient myth of Theseus and Minotaur. Were it not for my brother, I would never have met the psychiatrist who had a renowned career of conventional success to open homes. Uh, I'm sorry, wow. Were it not for my brother, I would never have met the psychiatrist who had renounced the career of conventional success to open homes for those with psychoses, with hallucinations and delusions and the most extreme diagnoses. Homes where the curative treaty was a rabbinic parable, the turkey prince. Were it not for my brother, I would never have found myself underlying sentences in a 2019 lead article in the New, Jer in the New England Journal of Medicine examining psychiatry's identity crisis. Were it not for my brother, I would never have confronted all that we do not control, or despite confronting this constantly, as so many of us do, I would never have contemplated it the way I have, wondering about the cost of our belief in biological psychiatry, calculating and recalculating the cost of centuries old faith rooted in the Enlightenment, in the potential of science and medicine to right our minds, tallying and retelling the price we pay in our desire to keep ourselves and those we love away from life's agonies and clear of its precipices. Wow, man, phenomenal writing. Uh, so one of my favorite passages in the book. So Dan, can you tell us a little bit how your brother sparred or uh, how he pretty much got you started on the journey into mental illness? And especially as we're thinking about it in terms of biology and we're thinking about it in terms of neuroscience, how is it that you came or tried to sort of understand his illness in the context of it? Sure. Um, and thanks for that reading. Uh, that's a passage that sort of pulled the ideas of the book together for me too. So when my brother and I were in our early 20s, he was diagnosed as what was called then manic depressive, now called bipolar, and quite severely so in the eyes of psychiatrists. So my parents were warned that he was likely to even kill himself if he weren't put on and kept on very strong medications. He was hospitalized and then hospitalized down the road again. Um, all this was happening as what we now take for granted, which is the biological and medical view of psychiatry, as that was really taking hold. So this was the early 80s, mm -hmm. and we were taught to believe that medicine could take care of our minds. So my brother goes on heavy medication, it has a real price for him because he had ambitions as a musician. And then years down the line, takes himself off medication against all advice and is now decades later and for decades now living a flourishing life, which we should get to um, down the road. And it's always raised questions for us how accurate was and is our vision of our minds through this biomedical psychiatric lens that we all still put our faith in? Or are there other ways to see ourselves, to see who we are, to see what our minds are, uh, other ways opposed to this very uh, biomedical vision? I'll add one thing and then turn it back to you. We're at a point now, decades later, 
where some of the best neuroscientists, some of the best research psychiatrists are saying, wait a sec, it's been at least 50 years since we've really made any progress in medicating our mental health. And thus, is it time to reevaluate? And I think those forces, you know, as I encapsulated in that little bit from the New England Journal of Medicine that you read, those forces of scientific questioning and of my brother's story came together and made me want to really go deeper. Wow. Mm -hmm. And how did you guys understand, well, your family, how did you guys understand what was going on with him at the time? Because I mean, it must have been shocking to you. Here was this person who I think was a teenager at the time. And I mean, he just maybe not became completely different, but I mean, it became a little bit erratic, which we, I'm assuming you guys weren't used to. So, right. So very early 20s. Um, and at the time, and I should, I should be careful to honor his perspective for a sec. Mm -hmm. So he would say, he would reject the diagnosis entirely. And I think with some grounds. On the other hand, if you look back at the records, he had ideas of having special powers. Um, uh, so by the DSM, the Bible of Psychiatric Diagnosis, he would qualify for the diagnosis he was given. Um, my parents were just stunned. My dad's a public health physician. My mom's a sociologist and medical researcher. You know, they were rationalists. They, they believed in science to get us out of just about anything. And my dad had done some great work both here and in Seattle, you know, making people safer, which is what public health physicians are supposed to do. But he was really just out of his depth. I think we all were. And I think my brother was suddenly seen through a lens that he felt was really, really limiting. Like all of a sudden he's told in the phrase of, of that moment that he has a broken brain and that the way to go about this is to heavily medicate it. And he didn't want to see himself as having a broken brain. And as it turns out, he was right. He should not have seen himself as having a broken brain. So, you know, I was just talking to a friend yesterday who's going through exactly the same thing with a child, a late teenage child, diagnosed bipolar, and the mom's in panic. And I so get that. I mean, that's part of what this story is about, is about what happens to parents and what happens to families. And yet I hope the book offers reason to take a deep breath and to perhaps see this as the complex situation it is and perhaps as the temporary situation that it can be despite what we're often told, which is that it's permanent and that you better get yourself or your loved one on medication. I'm one last thing. I'm not here to say put away your medication. Absolutely not. That would be beyond irresponsible of me. But I am here to raise some questions, and I hope the book raises some real questions about how we see our brains and how we see our minds, and the fact that that's two different things that the brain and the mind aren't equivalents right. yeah. and so, sorry uh, I, so my own faith over the years in psychotropic medications has been somewhat uh, shaken although i would definitely tag what you just said of course uh, doesn't mean that it doesn't work for people for uh, even some of your patients right if they're put on some psychotropic medication it may actually level them out to a level where at least then they can begin to uh, maybe with some clarity talk about their issues through sort of a different filter yeah correct mm -hmm. so but yeah uh, and i don't think i've ever shared this story before um but yeah my my own mother uh at a, when, when i was very young she was diagnosed with uh schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and she was on she actually went through treatments of uh, electric uh, shock therapy 
she was on Prozac and um, that definitely shaped her uh, personality and her behavior uh, with me at a young age. Um, I, at, the, at a young age, though, I couldn't necessarily tell that there was an issue, right? At the, I mean, you know, to me, it's like, oh, that's my mom still, you know, somebody who cares about you and all that kind of stuff. But when I look at it, you know, in hindsight, I do see the ways that it did affect her emotionally and in her behavior. And um, yeah, I wonder what could have happened if maybe, you know, maybe if she wasn't told that she was sick, or if maybe she didn't have such a uh, belief in that label, uh, maybe what other actions could she have taken? Could she have tried other uh, treatments? Uh, could she have uh, lived uh, or led a more happier life, perhaps? You know, these are questions that sort of come up. And I don't know. So um, for the people that it works for, that's great. But they're like, like some of the stories in your book, like, for example, people who took a uh, uh, Thorazine, for instance, and then had, uh, you know, side effects uh, that, you know, what was it like Parkinson's? Yeah, the tremors. Yeah. Tremors. And, and that's scary stuff, right? I mean, it's important to have uh, faith in science and faith in, you know, uh, maybe your doctor telling you, okay, I think this drug is, is good for you. Let's, let's give this a shot. But um, then when you see these kinds of side effects and how it affects people, it feels like, it's uh, not the ideal way to deal with these sorts of situations. Right. So Dan, I mean, from your perspective, how do we then balance that? Because it's so easy to one way or the other, where you're falling to kind of delusional optimism and you're saying, okay, you know, we finally got it, right? We got this thing that's finally going to fix everything and the world is going to be so much better. But then after seeing the results fall into, I mean, I guess we could also call it a bit of delusional, but it's extreme pessimism and saying, oh, forget it. You know, why you, why even bother anymore? We're never going to find the cure. Right. And this is a question I pose to the scientists on a regular basis. So uh, just one quick anecdote. Uh, psychiatrist researcher Steve Hyman, who ran the National Institute of Mental Health for a while now, runs a huge research uh, institute out of Boston. I asked him that once because he's been on the search for the genetic causes of predispositions to certain mental health conditions and emphasize predispositions. These are not predetermined uh, genetic factors, but they are things that add to the mix. And he said, you know, let's say a decade ago, two decades ago, he's utterly optimistic. We're going to solve this thing. We'll trace all our psychiatric selves back to these genetic markers just to take the markers that are involved in psychosis, you know, they've grown from the idea that there might be a handful to we're past 300 and counting. And I asked him once, how do you avoid scientific nihilism, that feeling of I just should give up? And he said, I am, you know, constantly excited by new findings and constantly appraising how much they really mean. I mean, he was just wonderfully realistic about the need for science, which has defined his very successful career. The limits of science. I would say a cup, I want to give a couple of notes of hope. So besides my brother, I'd say this the other very important character in the book, Caroline, began hearing voices at a young, young age. Um, and thus, I think in the eyes of neuroscience and psychiatry would be deemed a quite severe case of what conventional psychiatry would call psychosis. She would now call just non-consensus or unshared realities. But <laughs> she is a remarkable human being who would ask me from time to time to repeat a question because her voices were too loud. So she was, is living um, in sort of multiple spaces, but beyond fully coherent, you know, in conversation. And she's a great advocate for something called the Hearing Voices Network. And the basic operative principle is that rather than do what mainstream psychiatry tends to, which is to sort of look at someone with voices or visions and 
try to suppress those immediately. Like that becomes the main goal. You want to suppress them, you want to control them, you want to constrain them, and you certainly don't want to linger on them and seemingly help them to flourish. That's not Caroline's or the Hearing Voices Network's approach at all. They are bringing together people in a room, and for shorthand, though it's a little bit of a distortion, just picture your basic Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, right? And so you're bringing people together and they are actually sharing their experience with alternate realities. With the idea that the result is by sort of removing the pressure of isolation and removing that sense of shame and that comes often with difference, you're actually lowering the impact and the hold of the voices. And you're often finding ways just to navigate, to cope. Often people talk, I didn't know this sounds naive about negotiating with the voices, finding ways to relate to them that aren't in combat so that you're giving them space without mm -hmm. allowing them to completely dominate. You know, would this have been the solution for your mom? I don't know. I, I would be, again, naive to promise that, but it does seem promising. Um, it's a, it's just, it's an entirely different way of seeing um, that doesn't put so much emphasis on just suppression. And to go back to the drugs, even though we've had a new generation of drugs since Thorazine, what's known as the second generation antipsychotics, they still have terrible, terrible side effects um, that can really be debilitating in themselves. And they're not always, possibly not even much more than half the time, successful at suppressing those alternate realities. So we're, we really have to find new ways to think about this. Last thing Caroline would say, let's think about these alternate voices, visions, realities as a kind of neurodivergence and start from that kind of acceptance and then figure out how to treat. Yeah, I love that so much. So it, it sort of makes me think about the way that I would think of cognitive behavioral therapy. So we often think of it in terms of combat where, you know, you're sort of challenging and you're kind of sub subduing or you're, you know, you're looking for a, a way to kind of um, not just manage, but you're looking for a way to dominate your thoughts. So oftentimes when people tell me, you know, they ask, uh, how come CBT doesn't work for me? Right. And then I'm kind of asking, okay, but like, how are you doing it? And they say, well, I tell myself, stop being irrational. Like, what are you doing? You're just being irrational. And so it's interesting because it doesn't work, right? Because if you think about just telling yourself that you're being irrational, even if some part of you believes it, what that means is that you're essentially just suppressing the other part. And that's essentially what we're seeing with sort of treatment for psychosis. We're seeing that these drugs are trying to kind of subdue these voices. And obviously, oftentimes they don't work is because that's not really how the mind works. You can't just dominate it into submission or shame yourself into submission. So what's interesting is I see a correlation between this and effective CBT therapy, where you kind of honor those sort of internal voices in this case case, not so much, obviously, uh, voices related to psychosis, but you honor kind of your internal shame and you honor the internal critic and you say, okay, like, what is it about what you're saying that's actually true? What is it about it that's actually not true? Is there a way for there to be a harmony between, hey, I think I'm a terrible person and hey, maybe sometimes I do some good things. Whereas, you know, on the one hand, I'm not saying stop being so irrational. You're being, you're being an idiot. You're, you're being dumb. You know, whatever it is that we tell ourselves, you're worthless, yada, yada. I can't believe you can kind of pick, like figure this out or pick yourself up. Like what's wrong with you. It's like we're trying to look for a way to hold these two different, this sort of just juxtaposition of ideas together and say to ourselves, there's a little bit of truth in this. And then there's a little bit of truth in that. Because the way I think about like, um, so Dan, I'm sure maybe you can even speak on this too. The way I think about like voices, just um, the way that we hear our kind of internal voices from what I remember about the anti-psychiatry movement of the 1960s and 70s is there was an understanding that the voices had actually something critical to tell you that it wasn't so much of like, okay, they hear these voices that are complete sort of sign of a malfunction brain with somebody like Artie Lang, he would say, and I think Thomas Oz as well, they would say, no, no, these voices have something important to tell you. So just like in CBT, where you would talk about or think about the irrational voices, you know, quote unquote, irrational voices, and you would say to yourself, okay, how do I deal with these? Or how do I live with them? How do I make sense of them? How do I kind of navigate them in the way that fits with the way I want to live, right? I think it's something similar and not too much of a step away from the, you know, hearing voices where you're essentially saying to yourself, 
yourself or you could be saying to yourself like, no, maybe these voices have something to tell me. Maybe this is not just the sort of a, the function of a kind of malfunctioning or a poorly wired brain. Maybe this is a significant piece of information that in some way can help me. Hmm. Right. Um, so when I think about conventional psychiatry's decision to view or hear voices and visions as meaningless, just as sort of a random assault upon the mind, it just doesn't quite make sense. It's all, it would be almost like saying our dreams never have a connection to our lives. There's all kinds of research saying that sometimes our dreams are random, but sometimes they're clearly not. We wake up and we know exactly what we're dreaming about. And sure enough, that's the same sort of thing with the hallucinatory uh, world that, that people who've been diagnosed with psychosis enter. So I will give you a grim example, but grim as it is, it's a great example of Caroline's genius. So she sometimes in her role, she, she starts these groups, she seeds them all over the country, and she also does one-on-one -on -one sessions. And she once took a call from a mother during COVID who said that she was hearing a voice saying she, the mother, should cut off her hand or the voice was going to harm her child. Now, when I first heard this from Caroline, I, and I like to think I can keep an open mind under any circumstances, but I shut down a little bit. I was stunned by that, by the terror of that, and I didn't press her for more details. In a recent conversation, she told me what had happened in the conversation with this mother. And that was that Caroline had said, steering the mother kind of gently in this direction, well, I think the voice might have been trying to teach you even in these horrific terms. And slowly Caroline led her to the possibility that the voice might have been saying, as a young mother, especially during the isolation of COVID, you're feeling that there's this dire conflict between loving and taking care of your child and all that you might be asked to give up or the pressures you're under as a caretaker of that child. And it almost sometimes feels impossible. So here's this voice coming in with this very threatening either or proposition. And I just thought, wow, like you, Caroline, you're a really good psychoanalyst to come up with that on the spot. And it goes right to your point. Yeah, there are ways to listen to the voices, interpret them, make meaning of them. That actually gives the voice here a kind of control. The voice is no longer beyond one's grasp coming randomly from a distance, but is part of one's life, difficult, a difficult part of one's life, but still part of it, and thus part of what we might be able to at least partially control. That's interesting because the way that mother, or the way Caroline suggested that that mother interpret the voice, it reminds me of sort of how you would interpret a dream or even poetry in a yeah. way it's not exactly it's not meant or to be by taken the way literally. even a negative situation if we're thinking about resilience and trauma right what do you take away from it interesting could you elaborate yeah so it's like the sort of nietzsche nietzsche in the idea where he said something along the lines of like situations aren't necessarily terrible for me they're more like opportunities right mm -hmm. so where the idea is like what is it that i could actually how can i interpret the situation in a way that helps me not only move forward but grow from it but become sort of better stronger you know Mm -hmm. You know, this is a, I wonder if this is like sort of a strange place to take this, but let's see if anything we could get off this thread. Um, people who are experiencing psychosis and getting sort of an extreme version of, well, in general, we all sort of live with a voice in our head, right? right. And uh, some people, yeah. depending which discipline you're in, may call that uh, ego, essentially, like, we're all talking to ourselves. W would you either of you say that uh, psychosis is sort of an an extreme version of the voice in the head, but not even just one voice, it's multiple? It's a great question. I I'll leave it to Dan for now. I would say every, with every person 
whose story I told in this book, and that's mainly my brother, Caroline, and this uh, man we haven't talked about yet, David. Mm -hmm. I myself in them all. I couldn't really write this kind of book if I didn't. So the answer is absolutely yes. It's very much a book about who we are. And in fact, you know, I very deliberately use that we pronoun our conditions, et cetera, because I just don't see the sharp divide. Certainly, I'm not comparing what I'm up against each day with what Caroline is. I'm not making that equation, but I am sort of putting us as fellow human beings with a lot in common. And I'll just add one thing to sort of broaden this conversation out. If you think about depression and anxiety, much more common conditions than, than Caroline's, the same kinds of things hold. So there's this wonderful researcher who comes in at the end of the book. She spent her career in the hardest core molecular analysis, but she goes off and she tells this story with apologies. She's like, is this too woo woo? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She goes off to Burning Man and she doesn't do any substances. She simply talks to people. She acts as a therapist to people who are having intense experiences. And she comes back and decides to have a psychedelic experience of her own under very controlled circumstances. And it completely changes her view of how psychiatry or therapy should work. Not, I should say, in that she thinks everyone should be doing psych psychedelics. In fact, she would point out, you know, we've had this rush of media, psychedelics will save us. And it really breaks down pretty sharply. The experiments where there's a lot of therapy that goes with the psychedelic tend to be successful. The studies without it don't. And, and here's the interesting point, the therapy tends to be fairly spiritual in its orientation. So it's all about finding one's place or sensing one's place in a much larger cosmos, finding a meaning beyond oneself. And all things that I think we need to really take measure of here. Um, but she would just talk about the idea that our brains are these physical things which we can heal as we would heal a broken leg or a disease, that just doesn't work. This isn't a broken leg. And to go back to your phrase about honoring, she would add just holding. And she would say, we need to find ways to hold our conditions, to make space for them. She quoted again with apology, the. Paul Simon lyric, uh, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. And she would just say, that is a kind of motto for, and it gets much more complicated than this, but for finding a way forward for those for whom medication just isn't working. And that's whether we're talking about depression or whether we're talking about more extreme conditions, that's a large percentage of people. Right. And we could relate that to David's story, right? Uh, he he also had a, a bad experience with uh, psychotropic uh, medications and decided to resort to uh, psilocybin. Um, yeah. Could you could you speak on that and how that sort of affected him? Yeah, I mean, he was desperate. He he's someone I should say he's just a terrific civil rights lawyer. I, he's the one character whose name I changed just because he needed some privacy. Mm -hmm. um, terrific civil rights lawyer has argued in front of the Supreme Court, but beset by an increasing depression and anxiety, and yet kind of on a border of whether medication was ever the right thing. So his initial therapist who he'd worked with for quite a while thought he was making progress shouldn't go down that route. He decided he did want to, and then decided after years, he wanted to see what it would be like to pull back and to take himself off medication. That then triggered some real withdrawal symptoms, which, as you know, are getting more and more attention, because of course, 
the SSRIs that we think of as benign are, you know, they're not, they don't have the terrible side effects that the antipsychotics do, but they do have side effects and they can have real withdrawal symptoms. And so he finds himself sort of overwhelmed by those withdrawal symptoms and overwhelmed by questions of who he is because he sort of stops being able to really function um, and raises all kinds of questions, I think, about just who who we are as human beings. What What is our baseline state? Where are we meant to be? How are we meant to exist? All those big, big, big questions are raised by these stories. Yeah, and I, I feel like I identified with David's story the most because just in terms of just what we would call clinically called dysthymia, which is not like major depression, meaning that doesn't sort of envelop your every day, but it's sort of like this underlying depression. So I remember once when I was uh, speaking to my therapist about the possibility of medication, she's like, well, and it was very similar to David's therapist. And she said, look, man, she's like, I mean, you can try it and you could kind of see where it goes. But like, she's like, you have like an underlying kind of below the surface, sort of like their sort of not sense of depression where the idea is like, I don't know, maybe it's just like just a part of your life, right? I mean, she's like, you've been functioning pretty reasonably well with it. And so she's like, I don't really know. I mean, it's always going to be your call. And she actually kind of went through the symptom list with me or the side effect list. And she's like, well, this is what could happen. So ultimately I opted against going on medication and I figured, okay, uh, you know, whatever, I'm just going to try to tough it out and just sort of live with it. But you know, it's interesting because until I read David's story, I was still on the fence about it. I was still like, ah, you know, but I've never really given it a chance. Yeah. And I was like, well, and it's also like, I would rationalize. I would say, well, you know, I don't really need medication. I'm still doing okay. Uh, you know, and my thing is like, do I really want to spend time on this? Do I really want to kind of potentially go through the withdrawal symptoms? So I don't even know if this is great on my part, but after reading his story, I was like, oh, cool. Like this kind of, my, this, it makes my decision a little bit more concrete, but here's my question, right? So before you go on, here's my question. I guess I wonder if like, this is a question maybe nobody even really has the answer to, but this is a question I remember posing to my therapist and she didn't have the answer to it. I was like, okay, so if I have like this underlying dysthymia, right? And this was a question posed in the book too. Is this just like a natural part of life? So is it that there's something like, because it is a diagnosis, dysthymic disorder. So I was like, is this just like a part of life? Is this just like a normal part of my life? Does this mean like, okay, if I end up going on medication, it's not really going to help me much and it's not going to be worth the side effects. Does this mean that it will help me much because I know a bunch of people People, obviously my clients included, who it has helped much. So I don't really know if I have the answer to that, but it does at least seem anecdotally like the kind of symptoms that I experience, again, pretty minor in, in their kind of manifestation. It does seem like it is a natural part of life. That it's not just me or even close to just being me, but I still wrestle with that. Like, you know, is medication the right thing for something that at least seems pretty normal? So I don't know. What do you think, Ben? Just I'm sighing because so much to say so complicated because of course yeah. we we human beings are complicated. I think for me, my personal answer, as I say in the book, is I'm gonna make that and even sometimes darker, much darker places part of my life. Um, they're part of my writing life, just part of me. We should just be specific about the side effects because you know some people decide that they're worth it and I should also be specific I have without naming them like very close family members who at one time or another have used antidepressants and I think use them effectively they would say um, but the side effects can devastate your sex life um, for me wild that the pharmaceutical companies downplay this it's sort of a 50 percent of consumers have that side effect in one form or another and then you can just just a quick example of how you know this is really profoundly affecting your brain i think almost anyone who goes off them experiences at the very minimum these kind of brain zaps you'll hear that very calmly so something is really going on anyway back to your question i think I would argue more of us could make those feelings something to live with rather than something that causes a kind of low level or even worse than low level panic. Um, 
but that I think that requires a method. So let's go back to my brother for a sec, um, who again would reject his diagnosis, but doesn't reject what happened, happened. I mean, he was in some sort of crisis in his early to mid twenties and even to a degree into his thirties. But, uh, you know, he, prayer, meditation, music, exercise, these are big and very regular parts of his life. I mean, I don't think he would question for a second that these are absolutely essential parts of his life. They're, they're a way to, to regulate. Just go back to neuroscience for a sec. So one of my two main neuroscientists, psychiatrists, characters, Eric Nessler, amazing researcher into uh, how we can understand depression. And he has this great way of flipping things around. He had this insight in the early 2000s that he really wanted to look at what enables some people in a molecular way to be resilient. You know, like we all know these people who just, they never get depressed. It's like, how can this be? Like, I can't bear to be around you because I don't feel great and you're just always upbeat. Like, how does that work? And he started thinking about, is there something in the brain of those people? And, and looking at it, not so much in terms of the neurotransmitters, you know, serotonin, et cetera, that we're all familiar with, but looking at, you know, within the neurons themselves, within the cells themselves in the brain and the mechanics that might be involved. But in any case, so we would also talk very philosophically. And he was the one who really gave me the sense of how different the brain and the mind are. He said, back when I started out, you know, I thought, you know, maybe this would be complicated, but we'd get there in my career. Uh, everyone was so optimistic about solving cancer. Uh, back then, I thought we'd solve psychiatric issues the same way. And he said to me, look, this makes cancer seem dumbass simple. And I'm going to give you an example of why. Every other organ in the body besides the brain, its cells do what the organ does. And he just gave me an example of the heart. You can look at heart cells. They're pumping, you know. Brain cells don't think. <laughs> I mean, there are 100 billion of them. And somehow they're adding up to way more than the sum of their parts. So it's almost as if the brain is there, but the mind is somewhere beyond the brain, hence the title. I mean, we can get to the moon. We can't, maybe we can't get to the mind. And to bring this full circle, even Eric Nessler, who is not religious, and is very, very hardcore scientifically minded would say, there's something about having a sense of larger meaning or about having a sense of where one fits, however small in a larger, I'm gonna use the word cosmos. I don't know that he would. That if not curative is a kind of salve for our psyches. And that I think is a important point. Like the neuroscientists I mentioned earlier, I don't wanna be woo woo. I'm a fairly rational person, but I'm gonna say that that spiritual element is, can be a very healthy thing. Yeah, it's like we would classify that as sort of symbolic immortality in a way that even though we kind of pass on, right, even though kind of corporeal selves, there's some part of us that's always going to be a part of the universe, not just physically, but just in terms of our histories and our interconnections with the world and other people. Yeah, and just to tag that as well, usually having a maybe, I wouldn't call it a grand purpose, but something bigger than yourself usually creates the gravity for your personal boundaries to for lack of a better term, bullshit, in the sense of like the little things that may normally bother you when you have this something that you're striving for, or you sort of have this, the way you see yourself in terms of your interconnection with the universe, uh, or with, with the world with other people, essentially, yeah, it, it, it's better than not having that, I would suppose, it's way better, yeah. right, it, it feels a little more chaotic, and you're subject to the 
just automaticity or whatever your environment sort of presents to you. And yeah. there's less of a sort of um, you imposing meaning on the environment. Yeah. And there's also, I think, a sense of like comfort and safety, knowing that you're interconnected to the universe. So if I had to say, I mean, I don't want to reduce it to just this, because I mean, there are many elements that don't work with what I'm about to say. Uh, so like with CBT, a lot of times, if we're just thinking about just reframing thoughts and thinking of the world a little bit more rationally, I got to say this and look, I'm not, I'm, I'm a huge atheist, right? So I have no sort of belief in the spiritual realm, but I do have to say that I can see this as a problem in the treatment itself, that it seems like when people are just disconnected or feel that they're disconnected from the world, no matter how many times they reframe their thoughts, it helps, right? I mean, because CBT is obviously effective to some extent. Uh, so it definitely does help, but you can kind of see it that there's still this sense of isolation of like, well, you know, I have to sort of figure this out on my own, even if it's doing it with my therapist, it's, I have to figure out like why I'm thinking irrationally. Then I have to sort of challenge these beliefs. I have to look for the evidence for, I have to look at the evidence against, and then I have to come up with something more rational, but even still, it's like, it's an incomplete sort of form of therapy because for a lot of people, even though, again, they could go through the thought record, they could go through, obviously, the process, they still feel like they're isolated from the world. And it still kind of feels like it's not maybe me against the world, but it's still more along the lines of like, am I protected? Uh, am I safe? Do people really care about me? Can I be loved? Am I lovable? Right. And my thinking is that CBT really offers one tiny component of like this bigger picture of what their lives could be. Also, just to add on to that, yeah, sometimes the answer is not necessarily within your thoughts in relationship to your thoughts. It might be actually just sensations in the body that aren't being fully... No, it's both. I think it's always both. No, yeah. no, uh, of course. I'm just saying, just to add on to that. Yeah, sometimes it's, for example, mindfulness-based meditation. For instance, uh, depending you know, what, what you do, maybe some people do pranic breathing or other forms of it. So, A lot of times they'll uh, think about things that may uh, trigger or cause reactions in them, or maybe just the things in life that may be bothering them. And of course, uh, yes, there would be thoughts occurring that you uh, watch and observe and allow them to be, and that's part of the acceptance aspect of it. Right. But then there's also this other side of it. It's like, what sensations sort of come up? And then like, you know, feeling them fully, right? Because sometimes it's, it's just that you you have the feeling first and then you sort of backwards rationalize a narrative based on those feelings that you're having. And because those feelings aren't being dealt with, mm -hmm. you know, when you only address things at the level of thought, you may just be, <clears throat> you may actually get an answer from there too, from reframing and uh, also maybe just a certain level of understanding. And maybe that understanding will cause a feedback between your thoughts and how you feel. Mm -hmm. And there's way more going on there. It's way more complicated than I'm explaining right now. But yeah, it, there's, yeah, there's a lot of things that need to sort of be integrated in order to right, right. have that healing happen. But you know, what's so interesting with that? And I mean, maybe this is oversimplifying this, but what I loved about Caroline's story is that it wasn't even that complex. Like really what helped her was to feel this unification with animals and with people that as long as like she felt as though she fit into the world, all of these ideas of therapy kind of fall by the wayside, therapy, medication, right? Or you just see this person that desperately needed to fit in. And I mean, I felt that. Like, I think all of us feel that. Mm. I agree. That's why I identify so much with Caroline and with her story. Yes, absolutely. So isolated in middle school, in high school, in college, at a locked ward. And then, yeah, begins at this farm to connect with animals. Then, in the most improbable part of all, begins to really connect with people as a roller derby skater and finally a roller derby star. I mean, she's up there on billboards in Asheville, North Carolina as a key scorer on the local team. And then yes, really connecting via those late night calls I alluded to earlier, uh, via groups, just via her work. Yeah, the isolation is lifted and that is so important. And then along the same lines, I just want to go back to my brother for a sec and that phrase you used earlier, um, our, I think you said incorporeal, incorporeal selves or something close to that, I may be paraphrasing. Let's talk about music as a way, whether one is completely atheistic or spiritual, this is a way to connect, right? That we can't quite describe what is happening, but we all know that feeling with one form of music or another. And what he does now as a volunteer is 
goes on to Yale psych wards at, at Yale New Haven Hospital and plays for and has sing-alongs with the uh, people who are on those wards, the clients, patients uh, who are on those wards. And, you know, on the one hand, that sounds kind of corny, but on the other hand, to go with him is to really be moved because he is nothing there's nothing preparing those wards for him it's like he's kind of wandering on there almost because there's no one announcing hey bob bergner is here um he's just saying come sing with me come sing with us and people do and it's a very transformative experience i think both for the people and for him yeah, and I'm assuming I'm assuming for them it sort of makes them feel connected to um well it makes them feel connected to people in the outside world where there's this usual kind of like uh maybe it's not usual but there's uh, the the economy between like us and them you know I remember Caroline had that feeling when she was about to get off uh, I I don't remember exactly what the what it was it was like a, a van that she was in from the group home and she was about to get off and she's like oh my god like what are these people gonna think of us they're gonna think like we're all freaks and then yeah that was her first time at the roller derby and then essentially she goes in and she's like oh wow this was like not Nothing like I expected it to be. So that was so cool because that was like a catapult to her beginning to fit into the world. So, I mean, obviously, of course, initially those experiences that from, you know, middle school to high school, totally not her fault, but then you can kind of see how that sort of poisons the well and gives her a pretty, pretty erroneous or I would say mostly erroneous interpretation of the world. And then here she comes into this roller derby and she's like, oh, wow, like, you know, people are actually kind of nice here. And they seem to be like very variant, right? Or they vary a lot. They kind of, you have like the black people and white people and you have like people who are really strong and people who are really skinny as opposed to, you know, kind of the vision that she had of like just these uh, gorgeous like models and lingerie or whatever it was like skating around and providing entertainment. So it's so cool that as long as like, as long as you have an experience of feeling not just connected in the world, but feeling like you have an important role to play, even if it's just like helping and uh, kind of like guiding or curating or whatever you want to call it, just helping like a, a stock of animals. I think it's so important because when I think it's just as therapists, you know, and scientists, we're so kind of bogged down in, into like the intricacies of the psyche and of the brain. And really, and I'm not saying it's this simple, but I think a lot of times it is, we're really a lot of what people need is to feel understood and to feel again, like they're part of this bigger picture, whether you want to call it cosmos or whatever is not really as relevant, but they need to feel like they're not outsiders. And again, that's one of the limits that I see with CBT therapy is that as much as it does work, oftentimes it doesn't actually lead people to form healthier relationships, which I mean, could be, you know, another form or another part of therapy, which is fine. But when it doesn't, it's like, it's so limited because you still feel that sense of loneliness and depression, even though it's not as severe as it was when it first began. Mm. Yeah, completely agree. Um, that's a big theme of the book. And I guess, you know, again, I'm, I'm thinking about that word incorporeal. One way to think of our history of psychiatry is go all the way back to the Enlightenment. Right. Mm -hmm. We began to have this faith that we could improve ourselves limitlessly through science and through rationality. That was expressed in the way we set up our government here in the United States. We'd create these checks and balances, very rational. It would all, you know, create a, a society of, of all kinds of progress. And similarly, at the same time, it affected the way we saw the psyche. We began to try to kind of physically extract our psychiatric problems. So we had spinning machines that would send the blood flowing this way. We had virtual drowning machines that would shock the brain into cures. We, you know, let blood and we blistered and we did all sorts of torturous things. And then we moved on skipping forward to lobotomies where we actually you know went behind the eye socket and up into the brain and you know poured out a little bit of brain tissue as if again as if we could extract it and then of course on to the medications but maybe all along missing this other track because it's not so easily subject to scientific analysis and that's the track of connection mm -hmm. the track of 
being part of something larger, all those things uh, which come down to combating isolation. And again, wonderful sort of counterintuitive thing about Carola and her vision. So she started this program of uh, suicide prevention groups. Now, classically, uh, suicide prevention really often comes down to a kind of coercive uh, situation. You call our nation's most called suicide hotline and they're act they say it's all confidential. And again, let's be clear. I'm not discouraging people from calling that hotline, but I'm giving an example of how things work. You know, if you if you meet a certain checklist of criteria, they're going to send someone to your door, right? So it's not entirely in your control. Her approach, and it really is catching on, she's now giving lectures all over the country, um, is let's kind of do the opposite. Let's make an absolute pact, no matter what you say in this group that you're about to do, no one is going to be called. We're, we're just going to sit here and listen. Not only are we going to listen, but we're going to ask follow-up questions. We're actually going to encourage you to tell us about how awful you're feeling and why. We're going to fill the room with this mm -hmm. on the faith that as long as you feel understood, you are going to be much less likely to actually take your own life, which makes so much sense when you think about it. But we, I think as a society, are so terrified of these dramatic psychological situations. So that would include voices and visions, which seem so different. They're frightening to the rest of us. Right. And thoughts of suicide, which is just brings up death. And we all know how terrifying those thoughts can be. We're so frightened that we can't imagine that actually allowing space for it. Again, that theme of holding it as opposed to expelling it and keeping it in a corner mm -hmm. might actually have a kind of calming, even curative effect. Because again, you're connecting in this profound way. And that's just what I saw constantly with her and also in my brother's life. Right. Wow. Right. That's so interesting. Yeah. Because it seems like for me, like the best times or the best forms of therapy are essentially when people, and I mean, this is often an issue just in the field generally with psychiatry too, when the therapist or the practitioner in general, isn't just like apt to, or quick to hospitalize where there's a sort of understanding that, okay, like, unless it gets to the point where not only is there a plan, but there's an intent to act on the plan, which I mean, we can, I'm not going to get into this too deeply. Obviously we can always have a conversation about this, but sometimes people think, well, as long as you you have either thoughts or you have a plan automatically you should be hospitalized absolutely not so there has to be a plan and an intent so sometimes when patients look for help i mean what happens is the psychiatrist is like oh i'm gonna go hospitalize you because you have a plan it's not that simple so i love that she was able to take the risk and she was obviously able to give people a space where they're not going to feel afraid to say anything because first of all look i'm not against hospitalizations but they can definitely be pretty terrible experiences and oftentimes i mean it's just passing the time as opposed to getting any significant treatment so we when you think about just having the opportunity and the space to be able just to speak your truth and for the psychiatrist or therapist or whomever just to believe you and say, okay, I'm taking you at your word that you're not going to take your life. And I really still want to hear about what you have to say. I think that could be really maybe not transformative. It's too maybe like an extreme of a term, but that could be at least somewhat sort of of, of a like of a salve for that person or just mm -hmm. a, an ability or the kind of like give them the position or the, again, the option to be heard in a way that other people would just be frightened to. Yeah. And I would say particularly relevant right now when so many parents are so worried about the psychological health of their kids coming out of COVID and there's been so much written about this. I would say first connect, listen, you know, it's, it goes a long way but I get how frightening it is. I have watched my parents fear that is a vivid memory still. You know, I remember them coming to me when my brother was in crisis and all they wanted was another ally who would just take on faith that the hospital was the place for him. 
I couldn't quite go there with them. And I think, as you say, there are times when that might be the right approach, but I think we're all too quick to embrace it. And there may well be other ways and ways that really resonate down the line in better places for that child, better places for the relationship between parents and children. Again, just because a bond is created rather than mm. put at risk. Do you, do you feel like psychedelic assisted therapy is sort of a breakthrough in this space? Uh, I tend to feel that way, especially over the past few years where, you know, uh, organizations like MAPS and Rick Doblin have sort of advocated for, um, uh, you know, psychedelic assisted therapy, uh, MDMA being uh, used in trials. Yeah, well, I, I think for PTSD, yeah. but, uh, and, and ketamine, I yeah. believe. And I think even in New York, that's, yeah, we have ketamine centers here. Yeah. Very interesting, you know, so it kind of gives, I don't know. How, how do you feel about it? Very interested. The caution is that I think the media looking for a great story. And of course, what's greater than, Hey, psychedelics will save you. Uh, I think is overplaying at least where we are right now. It worries me that these days, I think I'm the pick one uh, subset of specialists, but anesthesiologists are opening sort of, you know, strip mall versions of, you know, come get your psychedelic or ketamine therapy. Um, that doesn't seem right to me. Because again, what I'm seeing when I really read the studies and then read the long manuals that go with the studies is that this can work if you're guided toward a new way of seeing yourself and a new way of seeing sort of, again, how you fit into that thing, whether we're calling it cosmos or the trees. <laughs> I mean, it's all, it's all similar. Um, without that, you may just have a, a, at best a kind of temporary, temporary relief. Whereas with it, you could come to something more profound and life-changing. Yeah, I love that. Dan, I really appreciate your skeptical, but yet still pretty enlightening approach. And I mean, I feel like in this case, in terms of what this book has to offer, man, just from the personal, the scientific, the historical, I mean, it has pretty much everything that one could want in a book on the history of psychology slash psychiatry. Thank you. That's yeah. really, really nice to hear. Absolutely, man. So Alan, any final questions before we go? Uh, yes. Uh, if we wanted to follow you, follow your work, uh, where can we find you? So danielbergner.com is my website. Uh, there's some various excerpts or adapted excerpts from the book uh, coming out, one of which will be in the New York Times Magazine. Uh, but I think the best way is just my books. The books are what I really care about and would love people to connect to. Absolutely. Dan, thank you so much for coming on. This was incredible. The stuff we talked about, I didn't see it coming. Yeah, we, we literally covered so much ground. And again, your book offers so much value to so many different people, again, from the personal to just the historical all across the board. Thank you. Much appreciate the conversation. Absolutely. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right. So guys, again, remember the book is called The Mind and the Moon. My brother's story, the science of our brains and the search of our psyches. Uh, it's coming out uh, on May 17th. That's in a couple of days from now. You can find it on Amazon, other book retailers. Again, if you want to follow us, you can follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and at Seize underscore podcast on Twitter. Like, subscribe, hit the bell. And again, thank you so much for watching. See you next time.